for viewing on the Regional Connection YouTube channel. The meeting is also being recorded and will be available after the meeting on our HRTPO website. Uh, as always, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, we ask that everybody remain on mute with their phones and computers until the chair calls upon you to provide input. After speaking, please remember to go back on mute. Uh, please identify yourself when speaking or providing a motion or a second. And as a reminder, uh, we ask for your patience. All votes taken today must be made via recall vote and recorded in the minutes. Um, Chair Tuck, I'll forward that back over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome uh, our new HRTPO non-voting member, Carol Steele, who's acting county administrator from Gloucester, and also probably unbeknownst to him, but um, well, Colonel Vetter, uh, who's a representative from Joint Langley Eustis, is going to be retiring, and I think his retirement ceremony is this month, and in which case this may be his last meeting with us. So I want to wish you guys speed and match. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, like, okay. Um, Mr. Cook, would you please read the public comment? Yes, sir. And, and Mayor Tuck, Tuck, Yes, sir. And Mayor Tuck, if I may ask for your patience one second, I would like to make one additional announcement I just learned of this morning, but I understand the exciting news in the city of Suffolk. And uh, Mr. L. Moore, um, who has been such an important part of the CAO committee and many of our regional efforts, um, really pleased to um, introduce as the city manager for the city of Suffolk. So Mr. Moore, congratulations and welcome. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, Mayor Tuck. Uh, I'll read, um, we have one public comment. Uh, the comment is submitted by Mr. Mark Gedulded Yatrovsky. Uh, the comment is addressed to the chair, the honorable commissioners and TPO members and regional neighbors. Uh, although many of us would like to believe that we are nearing the end of the COVID-19 emergency, the like of which we may not see again for another century, I would not want to bet my family nest egg on either of these suppositions. Rather, I think we should be maintaining a running inventory of effective coping strategies so that when we return to a reasonable approximation of what passed for normalcy in the any COVID era, we should codify what we've learned and keep the documentation on a readily accessible portion of our emergency preparedness shelf. In that context, uh, Mr. Godolder Gutrowski writes, he urges us to modify our current virtual meeting procedures in two respects. <clears throat> One, by providing a real-time technological means to address the board during the public comment portion of each meeting, and two, creating an electronic sign-in sheet by which those viewing the board meetings contemporaneously with the proceedings could register their presence. These two modifications would bring the virtual and in-person procedures into closer alignment for the remainder of the current emergency, but would also lay a foundation for off-site public and ideally board member participation post-pandemic. He recognizes that changes to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act provisions would be necessary for board members routinely to participate remotely. However, he believes that multiple benefits would accrue to those members, not the least of which is increased personal productivity and use travel time. Again, by submit by Mr. Mark Adulda Gutrowski, a resident from the city of Portsmouth. Uh, Chair Tuck, those are our only public comments. Uh, I'll send it back over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I guess it's Mr. Mahaley. Would you please check and see if we now have a uh, forum? We do, sir. Okay, well, like that, we'd like to go to um, item number two, which is approval of the agenda. I'd like to entertain a motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. A price second. Any questions or discussion? So Ms. Arledge, would you please do the roll call? Chesapeake, Mayor West. Aye. Franklin, Mayor Rabel. Aye. Gloucester, Supervisor Bazzani. Hampton, Mayor Tuck. Present. 
Isle of Wight, Supervisor McCarty. Aye. James City, Supervisor Eisenhower. Aye. Newport News, Mayor Price. Oh, I just want Aye. Norfolk, Vice Mayor Thomas. Yeah. Aye. The Cosin, Mayor Housel. It's not the computer. <laughs> okay. Portsmouth, Mayor Glover. Aye. So, Southampton, so Supervisor Gillette. Okay, so I could talk now. Suffolk, Mayor Duman. Virginia Beach, Mayor Dyer. Williamsburg, Mayor Pond. Aye. York, Supervisor Shepard. Aye. HRT, Mr. Harrell. Aye. Wada, Mr. Trogdon. Aye. VDOT, Mr. Hall. Aye. DRPT, Mr. Brule. Aye. Virginia Port Authority, Ms. Vick. Aye. General Assembly, Senator Locke. Aye. Senator Sproul. Aye. Delegate Heretic. Delegate Ward. Ms. Aldridge, can you hear me, Gordon Helsel? Yes, sir, I can. I'm an I. I apologize. Thank A little you. difficulty with this computer. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Arledge, uh, did we have an I from <coughs> Suffolk? I, I know that Mr. Bennett was on. I have I didn't hear from Suffolk. That would put us over the top. I believe Mayor Duman is on the line now. Uh, Mayor Duman. <coughs> Is Mr. Bennett available? Mr. Chairman, I also, yes. I also saw Delegate G1 Ward. Bennett, I have suffered. Thank you, sir. And, and my president should have been I. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. we. Uh, the motion is approved. Thank you, Mr. Mahalo. Thank you. Okay. Um, gracious, Mr. Crom. Um, I'm going to go back. Item four. Got that in? Yes, sir. Would you like me to provide the executive director's report? Yes, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, included in your agenda is my monthly report for your review. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. I would like to highlight two items, if I may, Mr. Chairman, for the TPO board. First off, our regional transit advisory panel has really been working well. It's a 67 member transit advisory panel that's divided itself up into a series of nine work groups. Those work groups are going to begin reporting back their recommendations under various topic areas to our full panel beginning next Wednesday, May the 26th. Um, we anticipate the need for a couple more meetings in June, and then those ideas will eventually make their way back to uh, through HRT and WADA and Suffolk Transit. And then, as Mr. Harrell, Mr. Trogdon, and others uh, consider those with the most potential opportunities to discuss some of those ideas here at the HRTPO board. So um, uh, for our General Assembly members who uh, uh, pass legislation directing us to work with our transit partners and these uh, community members, just wanted to report that that process, and Mr. Harrell, I see you on um, Mr. Harrell and I talk all the time about this, but William, if you wouldn't mind saying a comment or two, I think it's going incredibly well. We're really excited about the great passion and support for transit coming out of this town. I'll just say uh, thank you, Bob, and I appreciate your coordination of these various committees. Needless to say, they are keeping us busy uh, from uh, discussing bus stop amenities to even discussions around transit oriented development. The listing of the various groups uh, is in your package and we're looking forward to uh, uh, the recommendations that will be coming 
forward. And certainly as we look forward to working with uh, our board and um, improving our strategic plans, many of the recommendations that will come from this group will certainly inform uh, future updates of the strategic plan. So I'm glad to be a part of this and thank you, Bob, for your coordination. Yeah, th thank you, uh, William. Um, Zach Trogdon from WADA has been very engaged as well. Um, Zach, I didn't know if you had any comments to add to anything William said. Okay. So not hearing uh, any additional comments from Mr. Trogdon from WADA. I just wanna move on to a second item very quickly. The federal government has announced a funding opportunity through a program uh, for transportation called Rebuilding America Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity. It's called RAISE, R-A-I-S-E. Uh, without getting to the full James. formula, or without getting into the James. full formula, I, I will say that about $500 million will be available nationwide to urban areas. Uh, we are looking at the um, capital trail extension through the peninsula um, as a potential opportunity to be submitted uh, for this funding. Uh, we've been working with the Peninsula Chief Administrative Officers. Uh, we have a meeting with your Peninsula Chief Administrative Officers for June the 3rd to talk about what segments of that trail might make good candidates for submission under that grant program. The grant program, it, uh, application deadline is July the 12th. And um, look forward to working with the Peninsula CAOs We'll continue working with them to see if there's some opportunities there to bring some money to uh, th this exciting project. So Chair Tuck, that concludes my report. I'll send it back over to you, sir. Great, thank you. Uh, item number five is Community Advisory Committee report from Ms. Terry Donahue. Good morning. You're on mute. Okay, okay. I, I, sorry, I had trouble unmuting because um, it's very hard to, to control myself when it comes to talking. Um, the Community Advisory Committee hasn't actually met since my last report to you, but I did want to mention an ongoing activity, and that is a survey that the staff sent out to our members uh, a couple of times, trying to get some input, um, <clears throat> asking for input on our bylaws and our goals. And the response has covered a pretty wide range of interests and issues, but one of the goals was again, and I've mentioned this before, uh, bringing community issues that we discuss to the board for consideration. So I am, uh, an example of that would be the topic I brought up before and which Mr. Kudultik uh, Dutrovsky, and I think I said that right after knowing him for about 20 years, um, just addressed in a public comment that was read by uh, Bob Krupp. And it is the idea of making a formal request to the Commonwealth for continued electronic access to meetings after the emergency order is lifted. People really do feel strongly about that because we feel that it increases participation from more distant locations, which is a problem sometimes for us. Um, having to drive an hour and a half as a volunteer, especially to, to attend a meeting um, is, is a lot to ask people. And we did lose uh, some members because of that. Uh, we lost an excellent member who was coming from Newport News and she doesn't drive. So she, had, she depended upon public transit, which was not in the same status it is now with extra funding and things and, and changes, big changes being made. So she, it took her something like three to four hours to get to a meeting. And uh, she tried Ubering, but that was $65. So you can see where the electronic, um, the potential to continue the electronic stuff really does help. So what I'm requesting here is that for the next agenda for your board, and I think that's July, um, if you would put this on your agenda, this idea of making a formal request to the Commonwealth uh, to continue some form, even if it's a hybrid, whatever, of electronic meeting, uh, it, it just would be really, really helpful. Uh, since a permanent change to, the, to how meetings are done and, and changes to FOIA, 
uh, would affect our bylaws, we are putting that off. I've talked about that too. Uh, we're putting off messing around with our bylaws. Uh, we're taking the lazy way out until the Commonwealth comes up with a, a plan and at which point we will go back to our bylaws again and, and readdress them. And that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And my question is we have members of the General Assembly here. Uh -huh. um, is that something that the governor would have to do or is it something that the General Assembly would have to pass with respect to the continuation of hybrid meetings? Is there somebody who can answer that? <laughs> well, like I said, we've got members of the General Assembly here. So I just, I guess, uh, either Senator Locke or Spruill or Delegate Ward. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I know that, that uh, organizations cannot have private meetings meetings would have to be open to the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that wasn't, we're not asking for private meetings. We're just asking that people be allowed to participate electronically as well as in person. And that would be open to the public just as these meetings are. And electronic meetings would also have to be open to the public. Mm -hmm. Tuck, if I may. Yes. If I, if I could add to the conversation and say um, the current the current provision that allows public bodies within the Commonwealth of Virginia to meet virtually and electronically uh, was approved by the General Assembly in late April of 2020. That action by the General Assembly tied our ability to meet electronically to the state, the Commonwealth of Virginia being in the governor's declared state of emergency. The governor's declared state of emergency currently extends until June the 30th. Um, so we are approved to meet electronically uh, until June 30th. Post June 30th, one of two things would need to happen. Number one, uh, the governor's office has indicated that they will be evaluating whether or not it's appropriate to extend the state of emergency beyond June 30th. So if the governor extends that state of emergency beyond June 30th, we can continue to meet virtually and electronically. The other option would be for the General Assembly to convene and take action that, that would address that issue. But for now, the, the, the question at hand is whether or not that state of emergency will be extended beyond June 30. So thank you, sir. I just wanted to add those, those comments. We're fine. Any other discussions or questions on that one? Because um, I, I fully understand what um, Ms. Donahue um, wants and I understand um, the letter that we received. Um, and it is a challenge. And in fact, I think even as regional bodies, we are now having to maybe assess whether we do everything in person or we allow some individuals to participate remotely. And if that ends June 30th and our next meeting is in July, then um, we will, again, we will have some challenges ahead for us because I think, you know, we've cited that individuals driving from Gloucester or from other locations really spend more time probably in travel than they do in the actual meeting. But um, anyway, that, that's something for us to consider and to pursue. Um, having heard that, we'll go to item number six, which is the uh, FY 2022 HRTPO budget, Mr. Crom. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Tuck. Uh, HRTPO board members, I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen. And I'm hopeful, uh, Chair Tuck, that that successfully came up on the screen there. <laughs> Uh, can I get a thumbs up? Thank you, sir. Yeah, so it's yeah. my um, my pleasure to be before you today to present an item that we're requesting action on today. That is approval of our budget for fiscal year 2022 for not only the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, which is the fiscal agent for the Transportation Planning Organization, but also the HRTPO. 
Um, just a quick reminder that we here as a regional organization, we operate on a fiscal year budget. That the, the budget I'm presenting to you begins on July 1 and would conclude on June 30 of 2022. The budget I'm gonna discuss with you today comes to you from your personnel and budget committee who held um, uh, comprehensive meetings discussing the budget on April 5th and April 19th. And what I'd like to do is share with you that leadership that worked with me and is bringing this budget forward for your consideration today. The joint HRPDC, HRTPO personnel and budget committee is led by your two chairs, Chair uh, Mayor Donnie Tuck, uh, the HRTPO chair, uh, Angia McClellan, a council member from Norfolk, the HRPDC chair. Also on the personnel and budget committee is Mr. David Jenkins, council member from Newport News, who serves as the HRPDC vice chair. Mayor Rick West uh, from Chesapeake, who serves as our TPO vice chair. As representing our largest jurisdiction is Mr. Lewis Jones, council member from Virginia Beach. The HRPDC treasurer sits on our personnel and budget committee. That's currently Al White, Chief Administrative Officer, Randy Keaton. And then we have a Peninsula CAO who is currently Mr. Randy Wheeler from the city of Pocosin. And a Southside Chief Administrative Officer currently is the city manager from Chesapeake, Mr. Chris Price. So as we walked into this year's budget, I, I wanted to review with you a, a series of budget considerations that our personnel and budget committee considered. And the first is that not unlike all of you as local governments, our regional organization at the PDC and TPO had unbudgeted expenses this year uh, that were related to responding to the COVID pandemic. Um, I have enumerated those expenses here. They total over $42,000. But the key thing I want to stress is, unlike local governments that receive uh, relief money directly from the federal government, and unlike private businesses, our PDC TPO received no federal COVID relief money to help us offset these expenses. And um, so, you know, with a budget of our size, almost $43,000 was pretty significant to us. We also have a number of other expenses that we need to address. Our websites are currently, we believe, outdated and need a, a comprehensive update and redesign. Uh, Mayor Tuck, you just led a great conversation about virtual meetings. And we think eventually we're gonna see a return to in-person meetings, but we also expect some people, just as you said, Chair Tuck, will prefer a virtual option. Even though these will still be public meetings, as was discussed in the last conversation, um, virtual meetings where some people are in our boardroom and some people are virtual might be something that we might have interest in. But to do that, our regional boardroom is going to need some investments to support hybrid meetings efficiently. Um, and we released a request for proposals to, to get that assessment completed. We have a data agency telephone system that needs to be updated. Um, we own our building here. The regional building is um, owned by you all as the 17 partner localities. Um, just like your buildings, our buildings have needs. Um, we have about $250,000 in uh, repair and maintenance needs. Everything from repairing our parking lot to fixing leaking skylights and doing hot water heaters that we really need to be taking a look at here at the regional building. Our finance department staff, led by our CFO, uh, Sheila Wilson, is currently a mighty staff of three, but that staff of three were really proud of the great financial support and oversight they provide, not only for the PDC programs and the TPO, but for the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission, for the Hampton Roads Military and Federal Facilities Alliance, for our new broadband authority. Uh, we're really reaching a point where we need an additional finance department staff person to be able to manage our financial responsibilities here. And then finally, uh, not unlike all you, uh, salary adjustments we think are critical for our staff. Uh, not only do we want to remain competitive, but we have not done a market adjustment here in some time, a market analysis, and that's resulted in uh, some salary compression issues. Uh, particularly for certain planner and engineering positions. Um, so we really think we need to do some salary adjustments to address compression and equity issues. And, and, and an item that's, that's been a challenge for us, um, one of the sources of funding comes from locality per capita assessments. 
that those locality per capita assessments were reduced uh, by our boards from 82 cents per capita to 80 cents per capita in 2013, but remains at 80 cents in 2021. Um, as a result, we've only seen an increase, an annual increase of revenue from that source of $21,000 since 2012. And that, that's created some challenges for us. Um, this shows our, our member dues related to state allocation. Um, a, a, as you can see, we were at a higher per capita rate in 2006 than we are today. So let's talk about the budget that your personnel and budget committee is recommending to you. Included in your agenda were all of these documents. We have um, a lot of figures, a lot of data, a lot of information on fund balance, et cetera, revenues, expenditures, was all included in your agenda package. So in the spirit of time, I'm gonna go through high level what the proposed budget um, uh, would, would offer. So the budget recommended and is presented to you for consideration today does the following. Number one, it increases the member per capita dues rate from 80 cents per capita to 85 cents per capita. That would generate another $84,000 a year for revenue divided among 17 local governments on a per capita basis. Secondly, the budget we're presenting provides for a 3% salary increase for our staff effective July 1 of 2021. In addition, the Personnel and Budget Committee recommends that uh, in this budget includes an additional 1% of total salary that we could begin using mid-year on January 1 of 2022 to address salary compression and equity issues. And these would be for non-management positions. They would not be for the executive director or deputy executive director positions, but it would give us about $42,000 to strategically adjust base salaries in areas where we're seeing these challenges. The budget before you provides for an additional finance department position and also provides for some significant computer replacement and technology investments. In fact, 15 new computers uh, would, would be uh, provided in this budget for this year. Hey, Neil, so the bump, the bump to five So cents everybody four, could please yeah, stay on mute, please. Uh, well, until uh, the chair calls on you, appreciate it. Thank you all. Okay, so what is not included? Um, the Personnel and Budget Committee at this point directed me to remove our plans to upgrade our websites and to explore cost-effective approaches to do that. So there were some great ideas presented there that we'll be exploring over the next 12 months. And then finally, Rather than uh, requesting uh, that localities reimburse us for our COVID-related costs, the Personnel and Budget Committee noted that the building costs, the, the investment costs, et cetera, are all reoccurring costs, and that a more sustainable strategy would be to increase the per capita assessment from 80 to 85 cents and, and not give us a direct reimbursement for those COVID-related. So Mayor Tuck and board members, that's a summary of that budget. The action that we are requesting today would be that the um, HRTPO board take action to approve the proposed FY22 budget as recommended by your PDC and TPO personnel and budget committee. Uh, Chair Tuck, that concludes my comments. I'll send it back over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Crom. I'd like to entertain a motion in a second to approve the budget as presented. And when you do your motion in a second, please give your name. This is William Harrell, HRT. I move for approval. Mayor Price, second. Okay, any questions or discussion? Mrs. Arles, will you call the roll, please? Chesapeake, Mayor West. Aye. Franklin, Mayor Rabel. Aye. Gloucester, Supervisor Bazzani. Hampton, Mayor Tuck. Aye. Isle of Wight, Supervisor McCarty. Aye. James City, Supervisor Eisenhower. Aye. Newport News, Mayor Price. Aye. Norfolk, Vice Mayor Thomas. Aye. Pocosin, Mayor Helsel. Aye. <clears throat> Fort Smith, Mayor Glover. Aye. Southampton, Supervisor Gillette. Suffolk, Mayor Duman. 
Mr. Bennett? Aye. Virginia Beach, Mayor Dyer? Aye. Williamsburg, Mayor Ponds? Aye. York, Supervisor Shepard? Aye. HRT, Mr. Harrell? Aye. Wada, Mr. Trogdon? Aye. VDOT, Mr. Hall? Aye. DRPT, Ms. DeBrule? Aye. Virginia Port Authority, Ms. Vick? Aye. Uh, General Assembly members, Senator Locke? Aye. Senator Spruill? Aye. Delegate Heretic? Delegate Ward? Aye. That concludes the roll call. Motion is approved. Mayor, talk back to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, Mr. Crumb, item number seven. Yes, I'd like to um, introduce to present our uh, presentation on the Hampton Roads Regional Gateways Analysis, Dr. Pavithra Parthasarathy, our HRPTO Deputy Executive Director. Pavithra? Thank you, Mr. Crumb. Give, let me a minute to share screen. Um, Are you seeing the presentation mode? Yes, looks good, Pavitra. Thank okay. you. And audio is okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Crum. Uh, so today we wanted to talk to you about the Hampton Roads Gateway Study. Uh, this is a study that we've included in our FI 2022 work program. So if you look at your consent agenda, you'd see an item called FI 2022 UPWP. That is the Unified Planning Work Program which lays out our tasks, our responsibilities, and also all the work that we are planning over the next fiscal year. So as we just heard in the previous presentation, starts on July 1 of 2021 and goes through June 30th of 2022. So we thought it'd be good because the study is just getting started. We will be starting on this come July 1, that we could have a overview of what we are thinking and maybe uh, if you could give us some feedback on things we should consider, what are some other additional items to look at, that would be very helpful. So this is more of a discussion. And so today we thought we'd present this specific item from the work program. So what are we talking about when we say gateways, right? So we have a lot of major important critical corridors in our region. What we mean when we say gateways, we're looking at corridors that connect our region to markets outside. So for example, if you take I-64, that connects us to Richmond and beyond. You take Route 58, it connects our region to the I-95 corridor. Uh, you look at uh, 460, it covers similar, uh, in some areas, similar areas like I-64. So we're looking at these gateways or kind of the way our region gets connected to markets outside. And I think in all our conversations, we've had so many conversations on regional priorities, the federal infrastructure package. And I think we all understand the importance of improvements on these corridors to continue moving goods, continue moving people. So for example, the I-64 29 mile gap between Richmond to Williamsburg is our legislative priority. Uh, we've had conversations on 58 and 460, replacing parts of those, uh, those highways or corridors with limited access. Similarly, looking at uh, Route 17 and 64, it's that proposed uh, I-87 converting parts of it to limited access facilities. So I think our region's very good in identifying these priorities. That, that comes to us all coming together. We know where important improvements have to be made. But I think we also know when we try to prioritize everything, um, sometimes nothing gets done. So what we wanted to do to, with this study is we know there are these important corridors. We know improvements are considered. What can we do to kind of look at them in a holistic manner? How can we compare these corridors across the region? How can we look at the improvements? So we are able to identify those improvements that provide the most collective impact for our region. So what, are, what corridors are we talking about? So I think we've all seen the map of our region. So if we look at the routes that we have initially identified, starting with um, on the south with the proposed I-87 changing Route 17 and 64 with limited access facilities. And you keep going to 58, as I talked about the connection to the Raleigh and then I-95 corridor going up north to 460, 64, 17, which provides access to Gloucester County, 
and then 13 on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. So these are our initial take of these gateways that we think we should consider as part of this study. And in the next few slides, what I'm going to do is show you some types of analysis that we could look at. Again, as I said, we haven't yet started on the study, but we have a ton of data and information that we collect as part of our work on transportation system analysis and performance that we thought we could just share with what we are thinking to see if that's in line with what you want us to look at. So for example, we selected here, it's not all the gateways, just a few of them, right? So here we could look at volumes on these corridors. We have data on total volumes. We can look at vehicular breakdown, say by passenger cars, by trucks, look at what are the trends in these volumes being, how have these volumes grown, are some corridors growing more than the others? Again, trying to understand the system usage on these corridors. Another way we could look at considering the important asset that we have in our region with the Port of Virginia and the continued growth of the port and our need to support the port. Uh, so we could look at port related trucks. So for example, this is uh, some information that we have from a prior study where we look at trucks that leave our distribution center. So these are port related trucks and leave our region from the distribution centers. So again, if you look at it right away, you can see 64 share takes the lion's share of trucks on these corridors. But one thing that our data is telling us in the last few years, there's been a shift in more trucks on 460 and 16. That connects to the growth in uh, distribution centers. So if you could uh, look at the slide, you'll see a distribution centers and logistic centers along the 460 and Route 58 corridors. That kind of also connects to the growth in port-related trucks. Uh, one thing I thought would be helpful to point out is I think we all understand these corridors are important to the region. I think we all know that. One thing we are cognizant is these corridors serve different purposes in different parts of the region. So in some cases, it's all about providing through access. Uh, you just drive through those corridors. In some cases, they provide very critical local access, right? They're connecting businesses, they're connecting communities. In some cases, as I just highlighted on 58, it's jobs along those corridors that this corridor supports. So I think that's something we are definitely cognizant of as we go through this study. What we're trying to come up with a ways of we can look at them so that we are looking at apples to apples is the way I would present it here. And then of course, other ways we can look at it is volumes, travel times. We talked about volumes, we talked about trucks. Again, if you are a traveler, you look at travel time, you look at speeds, you look at how many, I mean, you might not look at the number of lanes, but you'll be like, is there enough? Am I going to be stuck in congestion? So things like that, where, for example, if I zoom in further, if I were to go from here to Raleigh, I could take the 58 corridor, I could go down on 17, 64. Looking at lane configurations, how many, uh, is it a limited access facility? Is that something, how long will it take? What's the average speed? So these are some of the considerations that we could look at. Um, again, this is an example of the I-64. If you were to go from here to Richmond, it's a complete, it's an interstate facility. What's the average speed? What are some travel times? So again, these are just examples of the types of analysis that we think would be helpful as part of this conversation. And we think it will be a conversation that the board will have. Uh, so with that in mind, some of the things we are looking at in terms of the proposed study. Um, as I said, we have an initial listing of corridors. Uh, again, I think we will take a closer look to see if there's any other corridors we missed. From a transportation perspective, we have the data to look at volumes. We have the data to look at um, travel times. We could look at port-related trucks, port-related origin destinations. So these are all the transportation performance information that we could look at. And again, these are things we would start doing come July 1. But as I point up, pointed out earlier, we have we know there are improvements we've identified, we've planned, we've proposed improvements. I think what we are trying to look at is what are the other non-transportation aspects that we can consider? Are there some economic development opportunities? So we talked about job creation. How do these improvements help with job creation? What are the economic impacts? What how do they continue to help the port as an economic driver in our region? And overall. How would these improvements help the region's quality of life? So with that lens, of course, it's going to be more of a coordination uh, with our PDC folks as well, because it's it's got trans not just transportation, there's a non-transportation land use growth economic aspects that come in. So uh, we thought it'd be good to look at that aspect and then come up with a set of 
prioritize investments that provide the overall impact for the region. And I think today we just wanted to present this to you to kind of get your take on this, kind of sh share what we are thinking. Um, and so it's just a kicking off the study once July 1 comes. But I'm going to pause here, and if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair, I'll see if Mr. Crum has any additional points you'd like to make. Otherwise, I'll take any questions. Uh, no, thank you, Pavithra. Uh, Chair Tuck, as Pavithra indicated, I think today we just wanted to give a preview of this is one item on our work program that will begin on July the 1st. Uh, Mayor Tuck, myself, uh, Pavithra, Mr. Kevin Page, um, have sat with all of the localities along the Route 58 corridor to, to learn some of their, um, what they have in terms of challenges, what they see as opportunities for that corridor. We just think this is an exciting opportunity to systematically and comprehensively take a look at these corridors and as Pavitha outlined, where should our focus be in terms of how we best connect our region to these um, outside market areas in a way that makes the most sense for our Hampton Roads region. So, Pavitra, thank you. Chair Tuck, we'll, we'll turn it back over to you, sir. And thank both of you. And I um, want to find out if there are any questions or discussions from the members of HRTPO. Yeah, Mayor, it's Tom Shell, I got a question. Yes. Okay, on this study, um, I mean, for years we've, we've, sort of talk to these things and we've seen a lot of political action one way or another but it's about the tolling that uh takes a, and the effect that it has on economic development and uh, access to our quarter um and i don't know if that's included in the study but i i would think that that would could give us some insight um i'm particularly interested in the um the coleman bridge uh it's been told for a, quite a long time and um and occasionally i hear uh from folks in your county and and up in Gloucester concerning that toll and I'm just wondering um, if that could be included or is it going to be included not muted right okay uh, thank you for the question I think yeah we can definitely look into that aspect of it as I said we just presented some initial ideas here and definitely that's something we could consider and see how we could look at it in a systematic manner for sure okay thank you any other observations, comments? Oh, thank you. And uh, I, I just recognize, again, our region has some challenges. And certainly one of the things that concerned me was the 58 quarter that um, with COVID, I found myself traveling it less, primarily because of the absence of rest stops. So I found myself using 64 a lot more, um, but we need to make sure that um, we, we show concern for all the gateways in our area. And so I thank you, Dr. Babitha, for this um, initial presentation and for the study you're about to undertake. Going to agenda item number eight, Mr. Crom. Yes, thank you, Chair Tuck. Agenda number... Uh... Item number eight is an update on our 2045 long range transportation plan. Our principal in charge of that effort is Ms. Dell Stiff, um, who has been keeping you apprised of this process uh, over the last year. Um, Dell, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Crum. Thank you, uh, Chair Tuck. Share my screen here. All right, so um, today I'll be providing a brief update on our 2045 long range transportation plan. So this timeline shows that we are at the end of our uh, five year uh, planning process uh, to update uh, and, and hopefully adopt soon, either next month or July, our 2045 long range transportation plan. So as a reminder, uh, back at uh, the end of March, we held a special HRTPO board meeting in which this board approved our fiscally constrained list of projects for the 2045 LRTP, which was a major milestone. Um, this board also approved the associated reports, uh, which are our funding plan and our project information guide that highlights uh, each of the fiscally constrained projects that are included in the plan. 
and this board also approved uh, our conformity list of regionally, regionally significant projects for both the 2045 LRTP and our current 2021-2024 uh, transportation improvement program. So just uh, quick highlights of what's in our 2045 LRTP. Um, in, in our plan, uh, we have set aside as a region 17 billion for maintenance and system preservation. And then this board has identified on that fiscally constrained list of projects, 13.7 uh, billion in additional capacity multimodal investments. Again, these are multimodal investments uh, that uh, fiscally constrain uh, various road projects across the region, uh, bridges, uh, tunnels, transit uh, projects, active transportation, and intermodal uh, projects to improve freight. So we are documenting our long-range transportation plan through a series of reports. Uh, seven have already been approved by this board. Um, TPS staff is finishing up the final three reports, which will be presented to TTAC and then go for public review um, here in the next couple of weeks. And then all of these reports are contained on our 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan website. In terms of our regional conformity assessment, uh, this is something that has to be done um, in our area because we are, are deemed a, a maintenance orphan area when it comes to air quality conformity. Um, again, this board approved our regionally significant uh, conformity project list back in March. Uh, the assessment was sent to our uh, federal partners in early April. And actually, um, yesterday afternoon, we did receive uh, the joint FHWA FTA finding of conformity. So that is a major, major milestone for the 2045 LRTP. And we certainly want to um, thank our federal partners for turning around the, uh, this uh, finding of conformity approval um, very quickly. They did it in uh, just over 30 days. So it brings, uh, brings us to a, a discussion point. I wanted to highlight that our current long range transportation plan is for the horizon of 2040, and that expires on July 21st of this year. Uh, so, so not too far off. Um, as we, until we adopt our 2045 LRTP, we cannot consider any LRTP or TIP amendments that are not clearly conformity exempt. Um, the next regularly scheduled board meeting is July 15th. So only a few days before our 2040 LRTP expires. Um, so we brought this up to our uh, TPO chair and vice chair um, at the TPO pre-briefing call earlier this week um, of a possibility of holding a special June uh, TPO board meeting specifically to adopt the 2045 LRTP so that we're not waiting to just days before the 2040 LRTP expires. Um, so at that point, um, our, our uh, TPO chair and vice chair wanted us to bring this item up um, for the, for the board to discuss the possibility of having a special June board meeting, again, specifically to adopt the 2045 LRTP. And that concludes my formal presentation. So I'd be happy to, to answer any questions uh, or if you wanted to go straight into the discussion. Well, I wanna thank you for your presentation and to put this before the board. Uh, one of our concerns is that, um, as she stated, that the LRTP um, expires July 21st. Our next meeting is July 15th. And there's a real concern that we may not have a quorum. And so rather than put that much pressure on ourselves, we thought about having a special meeting in June. Um, and so we wanted to find out again now just the, how the members feel about this special meeting. The Mayor Tux, Tom Shepard. What happens if it expires? If the plan would expire, we would not be able to have any TIP amendments to the plan, nor any amendments to the plan. Um, and the which, project's going to stop, or I mean, well, I mean, we 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 received. So I'll I'll use um, this consent agenda this month of the number of TIP amendments that we receive on a routine basis. Um, I, I would say that there's so much happening, particularly with your HR TAC projects, that the ability to be able to be nimble and make TIP amendments to move money is needed to keep all of our projects going region wide is, is, is a really important, um, really important that we maintain that flexibility. Um, and, and Dale, the other bigger thing is that not only would we not be able to do TIP and LRTP amendments, 
But if we're in an expired status, Dale, um, why don't I let you talk about any more uh, repercussions that might have? Uh, my understanding is if our LRTP expires, um, some of the conversations that are going on in Congress now with the various infrastructure packages, um, that, that, that those conversations would be jeopardized for our region. So in other words, when, as we look at some of the questions they're gonna be asking for that federal infrastructure package, is the project in your approved LRTP will be one of them. And Dale, thank you for bringing that up. So we wanna be certain that we maintain that eligibility. Well, I just think that sounds like a foot stomper to me that you need to have people show up at the meeting so we can vote. We don't have to go out beg, begging people to be in attendance. Just a point of view, just saying. Understood. Mr. So Chair, just a quick question. Uh, yes. uh, uh, could we take action on this today or um, uh, do we need to wait until next month? Ms. Stith, you want to address that, please? Yes, thank you. Um, we unfortunately cannot take action today because we need to make sure that the public is aware uh, that the board would be considering um, a resolution to adopt the 2045 LRTP. So that wasn't on today's agenda. And we also wanna make sure that those final three reports go through the 14 day public review period. Um, so we, we can take the action soon, uh, but uh, again, unfortunately not today. And I, I failed to mention also in my uh, presentation and, and um, Bob, you can confirm that if we do hold a June meeting, it would be virtual. Um, That's correct. And, um, and, and Mr. Harrell, thank you for that question. If I may, uh, may uh, Chair Clark, what's important to understand is we literally at about 3.30 yesterday afternoon received the air quality conformity approval from our federal partners. Um, so I, I need to speak on Dell's behalf who's been working around the clock <laughs> with federal and state partners on this as well as other staff. Um, we, we, were, we, we couldn't put it on the agenda until we had that air quality conformity approval. Um, so that, that was why we couldn't have it on today's agenda. Well, Mr. Chair, I think that just uh, underscores the importance of the June meeting, and I, I think we just need to make that work. Mr. Chair. Yes. Mayor West. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it would be helpful. We're, we are talking about a very short one item call in meeting, but still people will have to look at their calendars. Could we uh, throw some dates out there and see if we are, uh, you know, if that might help people decide how easy this would be? Well, and that's reasonable. I think our understanding was we're looking at doing a doodle poll, but we could possibly put some ideas out there today, although I'm not sure how prepared we are. But I think for one item, we could possibly look at perhaps the third Thursday, maybe meeting at nine o'clock or something like that, just for out allowing ourselves even 30 minutes. Um, the challenge we have, all the respect, and I was gonna maybe decide when I want to bring this up. You know, we sometimes get concerns, uh, feedback about the length of our meetings and how much we try to put in the meetings. And I know we all have busy schedules, but it's unfair for those of us who uh, carve out the time to try and be in place on time um, that we can't start our meetings because we don't have a quorum. So it seems to me, all due respect, that we need to try and ensure that we either have a backup uh, who can at least be a placeholder at the time of the start of the meeting until we're able to participate, or we try and work it out so that we're able to start our meetings on time. And it's not my OCD about starting on time, but I just think it's unfair for those of us who are in place not to be able to start our business on time so that we can conclude at a reasonable uh, point of time. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, uh I would be in favor of a special meeting out of an abundance of caution. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second, Bobby Dyer. I, I would like to move that we have a special meeting on, in June uh, for this item. Well, we already have a motion on the floor by uh, Councilman Thomas. And so we've got a second by Mayor Dyer, but that's okay. So now, uh, any more discussion? I right, call the roll, Ms. Um, Arledge. 
Uh, Chesapeake, Mayor West. Aye. Franklin, Mayor Rabel. Aye. Gloucester, Supervisor Bazzani. Hampton, Mayor Tuck. Aye. Isle of Wight, Supervisor McCarty. Aye. James City, Supervisor Eisenhower. Aye. Newport News, Mayor Price. Aye. Norfolk, Vice Mayor Thomas. Yes. Pocosin, Mayor Housel. Aye. Portsmouth, Mayor Glover. Aye. Southampton, Supervisor Gillette. Suffolk, Vice Mayor Bennett. Aye. Virginia Beach, Mayor Dyer. Aye. Williamsburg, Mayor Pons. Aye. York, Supervisor Shepard. Aye. HRT, Mr. Harrell. Aye. Wada, Mr. Trogdon. <clears throat> BDOT, Mr. Hall. Aye. BRPT, Mr. Brule. Aye. Virginia Port Authority, Ms. Vick. Aye. General Assembly, Senator Locke. Aye. Senator Spruill. Aye. Delegate Heretic. Delegate Ward. Aye. That concludes the roll call. Motion is approved. Thank you. So what I'd like to propose is many of us have um, the third Thursday uh, already on our schedules, although there's no HRTPO meeting scheduled for um, July, I'm sorry, June the 17th. But perhaps we could send a doodle poll to see if there's a time on that date that works for us, whether it's in the morning for maybe 30 minutes or in the afternoon. And actually, I don't think it should take 30 minutes. Chair Tuck would be happy to do that. Yeah, okay, just a consideration, just consideration. Yes, yes, okay, um, that brings us now to um, agenda item number nine, Mr. Cron yes, just very quickly, our consent agenda item is included for your consideration. You'll notice the pro forma items, um, some uh, committee bylaws, uh, an item on critical urban freight corridors. Um, also, uh, a number of TIP amendments. Uh, that you'll see. I, I wanted to bring to your attention that we have started organizing those by locality that they're within and by alphabetical order. We thought that would be easy for you to um, um, take a quick look and see what amendments are happening in your locality that's moving money between projects or, or reprogramming that money. Uh, Chair Tuck, those items are presented in the consent agenda for approval and we would request that action from the TPO board. I'd like to ask for a motion to second approve consent items. So move, Shepard. Second, Gordon. Second, Gordon. Gordon. Okay, I think I heard Mayor Helso as a second. Yes, sir. Uh, any questions? Any questions or discussion? Ms. Arles, to call the roll, please. Chesapeake, Mayor West. Aye. Franklin, Mayor Rabel. Aye. Gloucester, Supervisor Bazzani. Hampton, Mayor Tuck. Aye. Isle of Wight, Supervisor McCarty. Aye. James City, Supervisor Eisenhower. Aye. Newport News, Mayor Price. Aye. Norfolk, Vice Mayor Thomas. Aye. Pocosin, Mayor Housel. Aye. Portsmouth, Mayor Glover. Aye. Southampton, Supervisor Gillette. Suffolk, Vice Mayor Bennett. Aye. Virginia Beach, Mayor Dyer. Aye. Williamsburg, Mayor Pons. Aye. York, Supervisor Shepard. Aye. HRT, Mr. Harrell. Aye. Wada, Mr. Trogdon. Aye. Vida, Mr. Hall. Aye. DRPT, Mr. Brule. Aye. Virginia Port Authority, Ms. Vick. Aye. General Assembly, Senator Locke. Aye. Senator Spruill. Aye. Delegate Heretic. Delegate Ward. Aye. That concludes the roll call. Motion is approved. Thank you. Item number 10, Mr. Crum. 
Yes, uh, Chair Tuck, with your permission, I'll, I'll wrap up on the last couple of items on our agenda. Uh, item 10 is our three-month tentative schedule. We will be sending out a poll to uh, find a time on that third Thursday of June for a single item agenda to approve our long-range transportation plan. From there, our next regularly scheduled meeting will be July the 15th. Um, so it's hard to believe, uh, Chair Tuck, we will be through Memorial Day and the 4th of July by then. How time flies, sir. <laughs> um, I also referenced that we have minutes from our TPO advisory committee meetings uh, included for your review. Uh, Chair Tuck, we have no further business for the TPO board. I will send it back over to you, sir. And thank you. Now, item number 13 uh, is old or new business. Any new business uh, anyone wants to bring up? Well, hearing none, we are adjourned. Everyone have a great day. Okay, thank you. Hey, Gordon, it's Tom Shepard. Gordon, it's Tom Shepard. Can you give me a call? Sure. You got my number? I'll put oh, it yes, on. Yes, I did. I've got it. I'll call okay, you. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye.